Welcome, friends, to the afternoon session of our monthly meeting. Very happy to see you again. I always get a feeling that we have known each other for a long time. And I don't know what the reason for that is. And some you meet me, you say, first time we are meeting you. And I have to think twice, that doesn't look like first time. So there must be some previous connections that make one meet here. As it happens, I believe we have met in the past lives. But since we don't see the past life, we don't remember past lives, it's just like a little feeling of deja vu. We have seen this before, right? it has happened before, without being able to pinpoint when we met. And so there is a natural kinship and friendship that is made just because of that. And so I have a lot of friends now, and uh, friends coming from far now. I'm very happy that when I've had my lunch, I get a chance to read some jokes. <laughs> my friend who is here from Canada, from Montreal, sends me a joke every day. It's a daily smile. But then he wanted to send more. So he made it into random smiles. And now the number is about eight or 10 per day. <laughs> so you can see my repertory of jokes. And I'm very happy. My friend, normally you might see him in a wheelchair. I first met him, he had to crawl on the ground. Then he met me as a walker. And he said, I want to see you in the Montreal airport. I said, how can you do that? He met me in the airport, then he met me here. Now, he's sitting right here. Welcome, Rishi. <laughs> when he has to come here, he cannot send me the joke by email. So he's handed it over to me, paper. I enjoyed it. Would you like me to share with others also? Okay, with his permission. A woman reported the disappearance of her husband to the police. The officer looked at the guy's photograph, questioned her and then asked if she wanted to give her husband any message if they found him. Yes, she replied. Please tell him mother didn't come after all. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you another one. A guy was driving very fast, 80 miles an hour, and a cop chased him. He drove even faster. He said, I can outrun this cop. Then he realized the cop can give signals to other cops and they can catch me in front. What am I trying to do? He better to stop. So he stopped and the cop came up to him and he said, I have only 10 minutes left for my, um, for my duty at this time. I have to go back home. If you can give me a good reason why you are speeding, I'll let you go. Otherwise, I have to give you a heavy ticket and even suspend your license. And the man said, I'll give you a reason why I was driving. Last year, a cop took away my wife. She eloped with him, the policeman. I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> he said, good day, sir. Go home. <laughs> anyway, this is an after joke, after joke thing. Before we broke up for lunch, I was telling you how, as human beings, we have the capacity to do things which are rare. The capacity to find who we really are. The capacity to find if there is something more in us than merely this physical body that we are carrying with us at this time. The capacity to enlarge our memory to remember things that happened way before this body was born. These capacities are there for all of us, without exception. There are no special people who have this. Every human being has this capacity, potential sitting right inside the head. We just don't use it. We are blocked. And because we came here just for an adventure, a short adventure, and we are thinking we are here forever, we forgot our true home. We forgot we don't belong here. It's just a temporary visit here. And to have a visit 
and make it different from our true home, we put on some costumes upon ourselves. And if we, at some point we leave the costumes anyway and get off stage, when we leave the costumes, we discover who we are. But can't we discover now and not get into the problem of suffering that we have created by taking this life as so real and the only reality? By taking it as the only reality, we haven't added on to our happiness or enjoyment. If you were to look at your own life as a movie that you're visiting, you will enjoy it more. Even now, if you can just imagine one little thing, that you are in a theater where a play is taking place, and you had a hand in the production of the play, you're also the producer, actor. But instead of watching from an audience, you decided to be close to the action and decided to sit into one of the characters' head, which is what is actually happening. You just decided, all right, it's a nice play I've set up and I'm going to enjoy it, but I'll enjoy more if I'm right in the middle of the action. And you just picked up randomly to sit in one actor's head and became that actor and forgot that you sat there merely to watch the show from close quarters and thought you are the actor. That's your real life. If we can recall this, that this is what happened and we are merely come here to watch a show, this life changes instantly from that moment. Now that's not difficult at all. Other meditation may be difficult, but this is not difficult to imagine or realize that you are really picking up one actor. When I make this suggestion to my friends, they say, if we had to pick up an actor, why would we pick up the actor in which we are sitting now? There's so many better actors. We could become the richest person in the world. We could become president of the country. We could become so-and-so. We could become king of Zamunda. I don't know, the king of Zamunda. <laughs> we could be so many other things. Why are we stuck with a destiny, a life of an actor, that's not that great. How did we choose this? <laughs> the answer is very simple. And I give the same answer when this question is asked to me. I said there was once an author whose name was Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer. He wrote a book, The Pilgrim's Tale. In that book, he was talking about 40 or 60 pilgrims going to Canterbury, it's a can ta Canterbury Tales. He was going to Canterbury, they were all going to Canterbury, not Pilgrim Tale, Canterbury Tales. And he was amongst them. So he is the author of the story. He is also the actor in the story. He writes how to pass time, there were no fast vehicles in that time. Most people walked, some were on horses, some in carriages, and they were all passing time, it took several days to reach Canterbury. So therefore, they passed the time by telling stories to each other, singing songs to each other, poetry, poems to each other, just to pass the time. And the most beautiful poetry with characters has come in English literature for the first time with that book. That's the importance of the book. Before that, once upon a time, there was a king and a queen, and the king did this and he died. After that, poem, after that book, the Canterbury Tales, now they say there was a jealous king, there was a generous king, there was a king with a character. The characterization started from that book. So this author describes, for example, he describes an attorney, an, a lawyer. He, these words he uses. A busier man than him there nors. Nors means never was. A busier man than him there never was, and yet he seemed busier than he was. It applies to modern day attorneys, you can see. It has to show off. Now, this is a characterization. There was a wife of Bath, Bath is down in England, wife of Bath. He says, husbands, that means husbands, at Kirk, at church, she had five. But without an other company in youth, I need not talk of that note. There are other companies she had. Now, these kind of characterizations have never occurred in place before. Not even novels. He's called the father of the modern novel. Just because of the characters he created in that book. Now he's one of the characters also. They come up with beautiful poems, beautiful stories. 
Then they say, Chaucer, come on, you also tell a story. Come on, you tell a poem. He said, I know no, no poetry, I'm not a poet. The author of all the poetry says in the story, I'm not a poet, I don't know. They say, no, no, we know, you are an author, we know, you are a poet. Come on, some, come up with some good piece. And he comes up with the worst doggerel rhyme in the whole book. And not only that, everybody else criticizes him. Oh, we expected something better than this. Why did Chaucer get into a character in the book? He's criticized by his own creation. All the other characters are his creation. And he puts himself there, gets criticized. Some people have compared this with Jesus Christ. How could Jesus Christ, who said, I am one with my Father, who is a part of the Creator, get crucified by his own creation? They think that there is a parallel in that. Answer in both cases is the same. When you are the creator of everything, you are all characters, not one. The fact you sit in one does not make a difference at all. It is the same thing that happened when we got into one character. We knew we created all characters. We are one with the same source, same being, which created all characters. And just because we decided to sit in one, to be close to a show, makes no difference to who we are. It makes a difference what we are watching and where we are participating as an actor. Sitting inside at the third eye center, behind the eyes, and feeling that's the place from where you are watching a show. And then open your eyes and look at the show. Your life will change from that moment. Such a big thing. And if you do that much, meditation will become easy. Because when you do that, you are pulling your attention inside anyway. So these are good tips for people who would like to try meditation are the beginners of that and they can really make a good head start. I mentioned before lunch that I'll tell you this is not the end of the story. It's not even the beginning of the story. This is a mental game. We are trying to talk of escaping from the mind's clutches. We are trying to escape from the mind's distractions, the mind's attachments and mind's desires. That this is the beginning of the story of the mind. Not our story hasn't begun yet. Our story will begin when we know who we are, where we belong. That hasn't happened. And that won't happen for a while. Because once you are ready to experience your own self, that was bo not born with this body, but it was existing before your birth and will be existing after your death. Once you discover that form of yours, all sense perceptions intact and no matter in it. That's the only difference. No physical matter in that body. Perceptions, excellent. All perceptions. You meditate within that body at the third eye center of the inner body. Then what happens? Which means you're withdrawing your attention from perceptions as you know them. You're not even trying to perceive and separate the seeing from the touching, from the hearing. Do you know if you do that, you combine perception into one perception. It's amazing. We have scattered it. By coming into an astral self, into a sensory self, we have merely divided perception, which is perception is what makes life, what makes us know there is a world. No perception, no creation. All our knowledge of creation, no matter in what form, is from perception. It can be mental perception, it can be sensory perception. When you reach a point where you can withdraw your attention from the sensory perceptions, from the astral self, and become unaware of sense perceptions, your total perceptions open up, and you discover what your mind is. You understand what thinking mechanisms are. You understand what the mind can do. You understand how destinies are made. You understand how lives are created. You understand how a static time can become a flow of time by placing events on them and moving through time. So many answers you will get to questions which we have been asking for thousands of years. There you discover that time never moves. Time is created in an instant, the whole time, past, present and future. It's just a creation from no time to time. Time is laid out and then all the events are placed on it. It's all one operation and then you are placed at one event called birth here and you are time-traveling all the time. People say, Egyptians could time-travel. 
we are all traveling in time without realizing it as minutes pass as hours pass as days pass we are actually traveling on time from one day to other from one event to another time is not traveling we are traveling on time we are traveling from one event to another our experience is traveling from one event to another so therefore we discover the truth about the static nature of time and space and that we are moving on the events and thinking that time is traveling and we are traveling from place to place now that is a interesting thing which scientists are bothered with today and very legitimate botheration einstein said great scientist said time is not separate from space it is only an ordinate of space the time space is one thing that actually like space has three ordinates height width and length time is a fourth fourth dimension fourth ordinate of of space the time space is one composite thing and both occur at the time of the big bang and both expand so then the nature of time should be the same as the nature of space in space we can go forward and come back in time we can't why not the same rule should apply if time space is one thing how can there be a different rule for one ordinate of time space continuum space time continuum being one thing you can't say in space you can move and come back in any direction time only forward this is bothering them so much is bothering them they trying to find the cause somebody has recently proposed with good microscopes they were able to see the structure of the atom and some atoms they find which are not spherical not not circular they have a slightly pear shaped shape and they are hypothesizing that maybe the time is moving only in one direction because of the nature of the physical atom well it's just a hypothesis but it's bothering them the true answer you can get in your own head by going to the causal plane at the level where no sensory perceptions work and no physical perception works there the answer can be found why time is laid there and why we are moving forward and we can move backward and forward at will just like space here at that stage you can move both ways there no trouble there time space is a continuum but we don't know about it here and we can give an answer to the scientist you want a real answer that you can really move both ways go to where time is originating go to the place where time space is being created to place events on it you get the answer so that is why these things can be discovered inside us science will take maybe 20 30 years to come to the same thing 60 years ago i used to say something is about space time and so on today they are accepting it. it took 60 years for them to accept simple statement that i was making 60 years ago this they will also make the same statement yes it's movable but not at the physical nature because nature, nature of matter is such the matter is holding back one of the ordinates for moving forward they already hitting upon it little bit but it can be verified that there is no real difference the hypothesis that einstein gave was correct but it defying explanation because of the nature of matter here and matter is creating that problem the atom is creating that problem so i am just mentioning these things because here imagine what we have in our head all of us no exception doesn't matter which country you belong to doesn't matter which religion you believe in doesn't matter what your personal belief system is doesn't matter what the color of your skin is doesn't matter what your age is, age is gender is all of you have the same capacity to go inside meditate first in the physical body by placing yourself at third eye center concentrate your attention there meditate upon the inner body put your attention third eye center of the inner body and you open up to the discovery of the creation of the whole universe all questions you ever had will so clearly be answered by your own experience you will have no question after that imagine all the answers are sitting inside us but an answer given verbally is very different we try to take the meaning of the words and everyone interpret differently and that is not an answer when you experience something somebody tried to describe to me what flowers are 
I keep on thinking, maybe what, what is it describing? Some shape, something. I look, there I know what it is. It's as different when you have an experience of something. When you have experience of the nature of creation, the experience of the role of consciousness in creation, you get straight answers from your own experience. And that's possible. If we do that, are we on a spiritual path? No. We are still on a mental path. We try to discover the nature of the mind, the nature of a creation in which mind, body, senses live. That's not the spiritual path. Spiritual path is when you discover the spirit, the soul, the life force beyond the mind. And that cannot be found by any meditation. Sorry. Meditation is always mental. No matter what it is. I have tried every possible known types of meditation. And I know it's all mind game. Let anybody come and show me a spiritual meditation. The moment you say, I am going to meditate, you are back in the mind. The moment the I comes, you are in the mind. The moment the ego steps in, you are in the mind. How can you call it spiritual? If I say, I tried very hard, that's all mind. Soul never tries anything. Only the mind tries. Soul doesn't have to. Soul, our true self, is very different from what we are thinking. It is because we are all wearing a mind and thinking the mind and soul are the same. And yet, all of us experience our soul every day here without knowing there is a distinction between what we are experiencing spiritually and what we are experiencing mentally. When we think, mind. When we act, mind. When we create decisions, mind. When we express intentions, mind. When we love, soul. We don't try. There is no attempt at all. When we have intuition, intuitive knowledge, no thinking, no mind. When we feel sudden joy or something, no mind. Appreciate beauty suddenly, no mind. Whatever happens to us with no time and space, and just happens in our consciousness, soul. Rest is mind. The distinction can be seen right here. Now, I am just mentioning something that is spiritual. That means they are coming from the soul and not from the mind. When you experience love for anybody, even for yourself, it's coming from the soul, cannot come from the mind. You cannot think yourself into love. You can destroy it sometimes, the feeling, by thinking too much. But you cannot create it from there. Soul automatically experiences love, beauty, joy, intuition, intuitive knowledge. They are natural functions of the soul. Thinking, interpreting, making sense, logical, make it logic, rationalize it, all mind. A two, big difference in the two. Therefore, meditation is an effort. Meditation is an egoistic exercise. Love is not. Therefore, the solution to going above the mind is love, not effort. Now, you can't create love by thinking about it. But you can feel it. You can be pulled by it. What is the role of these really, truly enlightened people who have enlightened, or who, that means who know their spiritual self, and we call them perfect living masters? Their role is not to teach anything, but pull us with their love, pull us beyond the mind. We think they have come to teach us meditation. We are trying to do meditation. They are pulling us with their love. And we gradually experience what is pulling us really. Why do we want to see that person again and again? What's happening? And actually, it's a pull of love. That very pull is going to take you above the mind, and not meditation. But meditation can validate. Because you can see experiences. Love is pulling. You can verify my master, picture you see here, great master, Baba Savan Singh, he used to say, meditation is like a thermometer. A thermometer doesn't give you fever. It can only measure it. Meditation is like a measurement in tool. You measure, you do meditation, you know what's happening. But you cannot create it by meditation. Love creates it. That is why true spirituality is nothing but love. Love and devotion. Now I'm adding one word more. 
love and devotion what is devotion is it part of love not really otherwise you wouldn't use two words when you are pulled by love what you reaction is called devotion you become a devotee automatically when you're pulled by love devotion is a response to love so love and devotion go together pull of love comes from one who is living in love when we talk of a perfect living master rare people there is a picture of a rare person i met he changed me and changed thousands of people completely and gave such information nobody else could give all in information knowledge was mental he gave true knowledge of the self these people are rare but they appear in our life by coincidences where we are seeking the truth the ultimate truth if we are seeking something else lot of other masters can satisfy us but when we are seeking the ultimate truth beyond the mind our true home they appear in our life why do we call them perfect living masters because imperfection is only in the mind in soul there is no imperfection since they go beyond the mind we call them perfect there is no imperfection in the soul at all consciousness per se life per se has no imperfection it's only when applied to the mind it divides it into perfect and imperfect good and bad everything is divided in the mind that is why they are operating from above the mind and therefore we call them perfect living living in the same form as we are living not living in the past not living in the heavens not living in a mountain not living somewhere else living where we can interact with them as human beings are they really different than us not at all they are completely like us born like us die like us fall sick like us take medicine like us eat food like us starve like us fall sick like us no difference in the destiny have the same kind of destiny we have the only difference is their awareness state of awareness they are aware of all that i am talking about all the levels and even of the true home beyond the mind and not that they got the awareness one day in a cave and meditated came us to tell us they have that awareness 24/7 even when they are in the physical plane talking to us they speak from that awareness they don't speak from remembering something they speak from what they are experiencing all the time because they operate from beyond the mind even when they are here they use the mind to speak they use the mind to explain they use the mind to become temporary teachers because we love teachers we don't love those who want to go into our head but we love teachers we want to teach ourselves and moreover they appear to be ordinary human beings like us and they are but if we meditate after they have said we'll go together after they have said let's go together to our true home and then we meditate we can imagine them not easy but we can imagine them and the imagination becomes a real experience as if they are really there as we go on the journey from one level to another they are there what is their reality who are they really when we go above the mind we discover they are our self nobody else our own true self is our master not outside we can't see ourselves they appear appear through a system of projection of the mind which is creating everything including them it does not mean that they are separate they are not pulling us from outside they are pulling us from inside and when you they appear inside and are there at all levels of experiences then we realize who they are at the top there is only one there is no separate the master and the self are the same self is the master and we think self is separate from everybody and we discover the unity of the self because there is only one totality of self somebody wrote to me your talk about there being only one is very disheartening for me here i have got some company i have got friends are you telling us that you struggle hard and go to the highest level and find there's only one and no company 
and nobody loneliness only terrible loneliness i had to explain that the top is not one the top is total total means all who are here are also there everything that is here is there everything that is there at every level is there nothing exists outside of that all the experiences have been generated in our true home not outside we have separated them by locking ourselves out of that experience of totality therefore i don't even say it's one it's totality of consciousness is our reality is total and when we experience totality you have no loneliness at all loneliness starts disappearing right here when we have a master because a master is the best friend why because master's love is unconditional totally unconditional totally non judgmental no perfectly living master comes here to judge how good your karma is how good or bad you are he is only looking at the soul seeking of its true home period he see this soul has been seeking placed miserably in a state of being where he is made to feel guilty for the bad things he did made to feel hopeful something will happen in a strange state of uncertainty this soul is living tied up in the mind and yet wants to go back home ignores all this other stuff and no judgment it takes a soul quietly with love back to true home that's the role these perfect living masters play i am distinguishing them from all other masters who can give you great ideas great experiences even out of body experiences even the astral experience even causal experience of the mind that's not what perfect living masters come for why do they become teachers and begin to tell us meditation why do they say meditate when meditation has such a limited role is just for our mind it is a way to keep the mind busy okay do this so we can do our work is to keep the mind busy with something it can be okay you study more books okay you come to more talks okay you spend more time with these people okay now you do meditation now spend more hours on meditation follow this particular diet that's very all these very important things make sense to us mind says that makes sense we have to change our lifestyle they do something else in order to get a spiritual benefit and all the time they are secretly working on the spiritual benefit by pulling us with their love which keeps on growing without our knowing sometimes wonder why are we being drawn i remember a professor intellectual examining everything from the intellect point of view came to great master and said master i have come to see you because i feel you are making a fool of people you are telling them of higher states of consciousness as you are talking to them that their mind can go to this or that place these are all made up stories there is no other life there is no evidence at all and the evidence you talk of some people saw it in dreams you can create this by suggestion you can create this make a strong suggestion to a weak person he'll see all your heavens straight away he'll say i've seen my such can true heaven it's just a mental game you are trying to play the great master said you know you have your point of view you have a right to have your point of view i have a slightly different point of view because i think that these things can be actually experienced as realities and not that they are just illusions being created or dream dream like states i think is a higher awakening awakening he said master you are confusing yourself and your disciples and get master said i do tell disciples that i am trying to do something they come i try to help them so maybe we are right i am not denying that i must be right you are wrong you may be right i may be wrong but we have a different idea so the professor went away next week he came again next weekend master I've come to tell you that what you say is not real it's just made up i can't believe what you say he said you have a right not to believe i am not asking you i am not trying to persuade you to believe even i am only saying my experience is a little different than yours so we have a right to have our own experiences so i am not trying to persuade you to anything at all and i am acknowledging your right to disbelieve what i am saying but since i believe it does not mean you also have to believe 
but I am I'm happy that you are honest enough to tell me how you feel. I appreciate your honesty. So the professor went away. Third week he again came up on the weekend to tell the same thing. Great master smiled and said, Professor, you told me the same things twice before. Now you come third time. Why do you think it's necessary for you to come and tell me? He said, I don't know why I come and feel like coming to you. I don't know. Something makes me feel. Let me go back. Let me go back. A man with total disbelief is being pulled by love. And he became one of the finest disciples of great master and got initiated from him. I remember. He became a good friend of mine. And so I saw this change happening. So it's amazing how masters, perfect living masters operate. They operate soul to soul. They use teachings, conversation, living life, instructions for the mind. Mind loves it. Mind loves if you classify things, put them in a certain order. I hear people describing these different levels of consciousness. Physical level, above that astral level, above that causal level, spiritual levels, higher level, still higher levels. Maps have been drawn. People send me those maps that we know exactly the whole route to go there. And I laugh inside me. They have no knowledge that there is no up and down there at all. That when you discover something within yourself, if I were to say I'm wearing a jacket, and I say, I am a jacket. A terrible mistake. But the worst mistake will be that if I take off my jacket, I say, I've gone somewhere. I've gone nowhere. I've just taken off a costume. These are costumes we are wearing. We don't go anywhere at all. When we take the costume of the physical body away, we take the costume of our sense perceptions away, we take the costume of our mind away, we take the costume of our individuality of soul away, we discover we are the truth. We never moved anywhere. We never went anywhere. We discovered the whole thing in the very place where the whole things were created. That is, therefore, the whole charts and maps that are made cannot represent the truth of what you are inside. It's an uncovering of who you are. It's not a going, it's not a journey. People journey, understand you have to go somewhere. Here you have to stop going. Our mind is running outside. That's not letting us go to our true home. True home is not to travel. To stop. Stop where you are. Mind makes us travel all the time in thinking. You have to stop the journeys of the mind. And then only we can be still. And people misunderstand also that word. Stillness of the mind. Some people think it means stopping the process of thinking. I have never met a man who has stopped thinking. A friend of mine did claim, I have told you, many of you must have heard that story about Harvard University. And I had interaction with some professors there who were very keen to convince me that uh, this is all auto-suggestions and hypnotic auto-hypnosis that one can get and see all those things. Later on, they both became spiritual students. One went to India. His name was Richard Alpert. He became Baba Ram Das by going to India. Another was Timothy Leary. They were both expelled from the university during that year. I didn't, I had no hand in that. <laughs> that was something else they were doing. They were experimenting whether an outside food like a mushroom can give us an altered state of consciousness. And they were getting the mushroom. Somebody had brought them from Mexico. And somebody had, now also somebody are bringing that thing in a different form. Latin, from South America, some people bring it from Peru and things like that. They wanted to experiment with that and they extracted this, the LSD, DMT came up at that time and they ordered these things from, his, from a Swiss company, Swiss manufacturer, sent supplies to them and then they were testing with that. But there's a very long story how I interacted with them and interacted with their group. But they changed when they were fired from the job for taking drugs and taking young people, students of the university and making them have drugs in a yoga center, which they called a yoga center. Richard Alpert went to India. Timothy Leary went in on one of the Pacific Islands and he set up a church called the Church of the Boohoo. He said there is no difference really between the divine and the ridiculous. So that's how he gave the name of the church. 
these people, one state, student of that time, he claimed to be, he has learned a yogic practice by which he can still his mind, which means he does not think during that period. I was surprised. I said, I would like to see that demonstrated in front of me. Will you come to my apartment, please, and demonstrate how you stop thinking? He said, there's a yogic posture we adopt, and then we bring something in the mind, and then we operate some process he had by which he could stop thinking. So I wanted to understand that. I invited him to my apartment, and he came, and I said, how long can you stop thinking? He said, I can certainly do about half an hour. I said, if you can do one minute, I would believe you can do it forever. Can we try for one minute? I said, I'll give you 60 seconds to stop thinking while I'm sitting here in front of you. And the 60 seconds will start when I clap my hand. So you can hear it. That will begin. And after 60, I'll watch my stopwatch. After 60 seconds, I'll clap again and you can start thinking. And then we'll examine what happens to consciousness, awareness, when you're not thinking. It'll be a very big revelation to discover what happens to consciousness when you're not thinking. Because we're always thinking all the time. It'll be a very good exercise. So he closed his eyes, he sat in lotus position, crossed his legs, put his arms a certain way, and he was ready. I said, you're ready? Yes. There goes the first clap. I am watching 60 seconds. I'm not looking, but he's in the same position. 60 seconds passed, I clapped again. And he was back, normally. I said, did you stop thinking? Absolutely. I said, let's now examine, if you can recall, what exactly was happening in your head when the 60 seconds started. When you heard the clap, how did you know that you have to start to stop thinking. He said, I said, don't make up. Remember. He said, memory. Remember what happened. He said, I remember. After I heard the clap, I said to myself, now is the time to stop thinking. And that looks like a thought to me. He said, just a few seconds. It was just a few seconds. I said, all right. Let's think, the experiment was not 60 seconds, only 57 seconds. Three seconds gone. Now tell me, how did you know, when you were not thinking, that when my second clap comes, you can start thinking again? If you're not thinking at all, how did you know? Remember, try to remember what actually happened. And he remembered. Yes, I remember. After I said, now is the time to stop thinking, I also said, and I will not start thinking till he claps again. I said, that looks like a thought to me. I said, okay, let's forget about that. After that, how did you know that I will? He kept on remembering, kept on remembering, and at the end of the discussion, and he said, oh my God, I was thinking all the time. <laughs> I said, then how did you think that you stopped thinking? He said, I don't know, because now I can recall. I can recall what I was thinking by your telling me, and I did not know I was thinking. I said, I'll explain it to you. Since you don't even know what happened, I'll explain it to you what happened. This mind of ours does not think in one channel. It thinks in several channels. And the best way to test it is, supposing you have been given a mantra to repeat. That repeat with your mind. And your mind is repeating the words, and you can hear a lighter word, lighter speech behind it. Am I doing it too fast? Am I doing the right way? Who is that? You think your mind is repeating words? Who is the second commentator upon it? Also your mind. Supposing you are able to control both levels, third one will appear. Fourth one will appear. I met one man who could take it to the eighth level. Most people can take it to fifth level of thinking. There are levels of thinking, and when you stop thinking one level and only think of the second, you think you stop thinking. There's a mistake you were making. Lack of understanding how the mind works. And imagine, if, if we had meditated and known how the mind works, we could know all the time mind works like that. 
it is designed like that mind does not stop thinking at all if it stop thinking it would be dead we would be dead along with it that's the life of the mind. it's like a heartbeat for the mind so that is why the mind cannot stop thinking stillness of mind something means different stillness of mind means ignoring the mind stillness of mind means let the mind do its job you do yours you respond to love mind thinks and you can actually develop this technique by developing what is called spiritual will when we talk of will will power that man has good will power we talk of mental will most of the time will power means how you can use your mind to do certain things i have strong will power i will not take this glass of water even if i like it i have will power has mental will power spiritual will power is to be able to say no to mental will power it can be practiced i have suggested to my friends you want to develop spiritual will which will help you a lot in life as against mental will when the mind says i have to do it say no it is very important no one time only no it keeps on saying no if you can be steady on this practice of no not every day not of everything only two or three times a day or even two or three three times a week your spiritual will will develop now what happens when you have a strong spiritual will mind becomes your slave that you tell the mind what to think you tell the mind what to be occupied with otherwise what is happening now we are become slaves of the minds mind is telling us what to do thinking process is telling us how to lead our lives and thinking process giving us into what we called doubt that is the worst thing the mind when allowed to work freely as it's working now creates doubt because it can't be certain it has no way of having certain knowledge it only can guess surmise and therefore the mind's wisdom is confined to using logic of two types it always uses logic to make sense of things there are two types of logic deductive logic inductive logic i studied in school about the two, differentiation between deductive logic and inductive logic deductive logic says if that wall is all painted gray that small portion of it is also gray deductive logic is telling us that the part of the truth is also true that the part of the data is also true that's all it never adds to new logic new information and we deduce things the, when we know the premise we deduce the part of the premise is true inductive logic says if this wall is painted in this color and turns around which i cannot see most probably that is also painted the same way the word most probably comes up in inductive logic the uncertainty principle can you imagine how important the uncertainty principle is to adopted in science when the quantum physics were discovered the uncertainty principle is a recognized principle in science because when they examined an atom an atom consisted of a nucleus which was positive it contained proton uh, not neutrons and it and it electrons moving around it simplest matter material is a hydrogen atom it has a positive nucleus and one electron only moving at an orbit which now with our new microscopes we know exactly how far it is from the nucleus and we know it moves in a circular orbit around it having known it is it in an orbit like this or like this or like this do you know how many combinations you can make millions of combinations just varying the just position at the same distance from the center where is it because when we touched it at one point it was there no matter where you touched it here there same distance it was there once it was there it was always there it was nowhere else before that it could be anywhere before that it was a wave of energy negative energy your observation and measurement made it a particle 
can you imagine human intervention made an energy into a particle if this is true and science believes it for the last 40 years they have been believing this quantum physics if this is true that human observation and human measurement can create matter out of energy which is such a difficult thing otherwise we have a big role to play einstein before he died in the last notes he left he said i did not properly give the role of an observer on the operation that i was observing there this the calculations i was doing ignored the role of the observer because of this quantum physics coming up this principle of uncertainty where it is is now not only accepted it's going to be used in applications i went to silicon valley recently and i have some friends there working on what is called artificial intelligence and higher forms of uh, algorithms that will be used in the future they are preparing what is called a quantum computer what will the quantum computer do it will make use of the uncertainty principle and your ob observation that means currently all computers work with a digital language of 0 and 1 actually it's not two let it's only one one absence of one is called zero how it started they were able to make circuitry in which when the current passed it was called one if they put a insulation it was called zero it couldn't pass through all chips that are in our phones in our computers are today based on that technology of a binary language there or not there one or zero we can now use ones and zeros in sequence to create music to create visual effects to create anything that we see outside we can even create 3d printing we can now have this put the same materials raw materials outside send a message on digital language zeros and one and if the material there it can assemble and make the same flower there 3D operations are possible through this simple language of two letters, one and zero. But when we write today's language, where we write one remains one, we write zero remains zero. Message does not change. Our observation makes no difference. Quantum computer will have the uncertainty when one will remain one or not. Based on what you are thinking, based on what your context is, it will change ones into zero, zero zeros into ones. According to quantum physics that is something totally new so when you see this power of the observation the human being how is it being created they are coming closer and closer to the fact that the quantum physics was based upon the power of observation human measurement need not be physical observation it can be instrumental observation it can be any type of observation any interaction with energy can make it better uncertainty principle is there where does it really come from go inside and find out it comes from the causal plane where the mind is constructed with the uncertainty mind has to function in uncertainty therefore the uncertainty creates doubt we have no doubt except for what the mind creates the mind creates uncertainty and the uncertainty creates not only doubt creates fear trace back your fears they can all be traced back to doubt and uncertainty they say fear is a fear of the unknown if you know what is the danger you cope with it you act on it you prevent it if you don't know what will happen i don't know what will happen that's fear fear comes from doubt doubt comes from uncertainty uncertainty comes from the mind therefore mind is responsible for this imagine if you can go beyond the mind what happened to your life here life of certainty not certainty based upon just a dogma or something certainty based on your own inner experience it's a great thing once you are able to go into the mind and cross the mind with the love pull of love you will be identifying yourself as a unit of consciousness and nothing else that's your truth that you are consciousness and consciousness means anything it becomes conscious of becomes a reality and become creation that you can experience that you understand everything about creation at that point 
people who have reached that point can we can call them perfect living masters they have reached perfection but they have not reached the highest perfection because one more cover invisible cover still remains these are uh, visible covers my body is a very visible cover sense perceptions can also be seen as a cover even thinking can be taken as a cover but how can you call a soul a cover what cover is of the soul the cover of individuation i am one soul amongst many the many is also illusion many is also we created from the one single total source and perfect living masters who take us to totality are very rare there are two types of perfect living masters in indian punjab language punjabi language you call them sad gurus and sat gurus sad guru who has reached par brahm beyond the mind and sat guru who has reached the ultimate what you call sat kant or true home i am very happy to see you and share these things with you because i know you are seeking you may be seeking something different you may be seeking the same thing i am seeking but i have a strong feeling you are seeking something very similar to my seeking and i feel like we are co-travelers i hope my sharing my experiences with you you notice i am not using any notes i am not using books i am not using i don't ever use them at all i don't feel i'll be absolutely confused i say ah oh, ah oh, baby yes perhaps have ever used these words when you want to speak something that you know it is based on experience not on based on learning learning is different from experience so experience yourself do not have blind faith on anything not even yourself test it out verify validate go with it if you see little bit believe little bit but don't say because i see little bit the rest doesn't exist you didn't see it doesn't mean doesn't exist so you follow what you believe by experience and say is it worthwhile with this experience i have to try the next step take one step if it works take the third step if you not withdraw you don't have to keep on pursuing something that not even experiential that is why the teachings of this great master is very clearly based on experiential evidence and validation for yourself and not based on any hearsay not even from masters don't even believe masters words if not part of your own experience so i hope that so many of you meditating will find the importance of sitting behind the eyes what we call third eye center the center of consciousness from where we are operating and do not try to make it up or search for it because you are there imagine you have to find where you are sitting yourself without being able to look at yourself you are there the, the one who looks be there concentrate your attention on what is happening there see things there imagine there work out things there look at the sky there do things there that will pull your attention there and make what i am saying part of your experience thank you very much for joining me today we will meet next month also and some people have come for the first time and i have asked for a personal interview i'll see them now thank you